Amen. You can be seated. There's never been a person that has come to the cross that has not met Jesus. Jesus has never been late. Jesus has never uh, denied anyone. You can find it in Scripture. Uh, the only people that are denied are the ones who deny. So uh, that's, uh, that's what that is. Uh, but uh, let's see, three people. It says one, but it was three. Three people trust Christ their Savior last week. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Good job. Brother Alex. Brother Arif. Good job. Brother Arif going soul winning with Brother Alex. That was a good report from them. Uh, March 26th, Secret Pal. Y'all took care of that this morning. Uh, tomorrow is uh, the Academy Spring Break through Friday. And then April 1st, Silk and Purple at 1 p.m. It says the Silk and Purple Ladies Meeting on April 1st. Will be our Easter prep meeting. We'll be uh, filling eggs for the children's hunt. Please bring a warm dish to share. Now, I can't help it, but April 1st is, um, I don't know its origins or April Fool's, know where that came along, but I remember one of the best ones uh, I ever remember was uh, we were at the building on Clinton Street, which is no longer there, and my mom told Brother Eddie Gallion that one of the buses was rolling through the parking lot and I've never seen Brother Eddie Gallion. Brother, you all know Brother Eddie Gallion? He's a big boy. I've never seen a man move that fast before. Uh, he moved up those stairs. I remember his face. You know, Brother Eddie, when he was on the move somewhere, you better move. Qu you better move. He will flatten you. <laughs> Not out of any type of anger, but if he's on a mission trying to get somewhere, that man could get... <laughs> Could get places. And I remember Brother Eddie just flying up those stairs, grabbing that handrail, that iron handrail, and just kind of hoisting himself up and spinning and going out of the room and going, Wait, what? <laughs> My mom was like, April Fools. <laughs> Folks, don't be mean to people on April Fools. You ladies be nice to each other. Um, don't uh, don't don't be pranking each other. Be kind and honor preferring one another. Uh, but uh, silk and purple ladies meeting on that wonderful day that we um, prank each other. April first, and then April 9th is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Just uh, just a wonderful wonderful day. And then April tenth, no school Easter Monday. So. Uh, folks to be in prayer for. There's a whole mess of them there. Uh, all kinds of folks. Good to have Brother Stoltz with us. Uh, from uh, he's been gone a few weeks from uh, back surgery. I was always happy. To see. He's a tough guy, uh, tough and faithful. I, I and I think more faithful than tough, uh, because uh, he's just a bear, a, a bear of a man, but I, I'm kind of like a a yogi bear kind of guy, a nice bear. Um, uh, and when I say more faith, more faith than tough, I think his faith is tough. Is what I'm saying. His his, uh, his grit to be in church and to be around the people of God. And I, I'm, I was so happy to see Brother Stoltz with us this morning um, and uh, our visitors this morning. I went and talked to him. and I, What was her name? Linda Grubb? Um, Carrie. Carrie Grubb. I don't know who that is. Just, is it an old member or something? Uh, yeah, I got oh, truly. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Christina. Oh, um. I, yeah. Jackie Harmon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's more than a yeah. That's yeah. Just talking fair about getting our school instruments. I would love for the kids to learn how to play instruments. Music. Yeah. Okay, Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's what Justin, the father, said. He said, 
Uh, and I said, how'd you hear? He said, the, the congregation. I said, the con- someone knocked on your door? He said, no, 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 just friends from friends on the outside. I was like, okay. I was like, that's really cool. Somebody recommended. He said, well, we were looking for a Baptist church on the south side that's kind of rowdy. <laughs> okay. I was like, what do you mean rowdy? I was like, and I told him flat out, I was like, we don't speak in tongues. I said, we don't run up and down the aisles. I said, we preach the Bible. And he's like, no, 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 I'm just looking for an amen. I'm looking for, for you know, some rowdiness. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, I said, that, that's us, you know. And um, way back in the day, it was kind of like a running joke. You got to be a felon to be a member, you know. So we had church members going out committing felonies so they could validate their. <laughs> I guess I'm out. Uh, <laughs> we'll start the unfelon Baptist church. Uh, but, you know, and I, I always got a kick out of that because our church was very diverse, always has been, always has been, because the gospel reaches everybody, you know. And uh, um, so anyway, it was great, great to have them with us today. And then uh, Sean's boys want to get baptized, so we're going to get that lined up, get them baptized. So uh, salvations, baptism, folks to be in prayer for, praises all over the place, um, and uh, uh, always keeping the Lord. Uh, brother, uh, brother Steve Jewell was talking to me this morning, and, or this afternoon when we released. He said, you know, Brother Jake, or Pastor Jake, he said, um, I go to bed every night. Um, and he said, I, I have a, Brother Jules has been through some things. If you don't know the story about his son and everything, it's, 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 that's hard to live with. And he said, the devil often attacks me all the time. And he said, every time I lay my head on my pillow at night, he said, I always tell God, God, this is, it, it's, it's on you. You got to take care of it. And then he said, then I sleep like a baby. He said, I gave, if I gave it to God, I gave it to God. You know, if I gave it over to God, then I can sleep peacefully because I gave it to God. And he said, anytime I run into stress like that, he said, I just give it to God. God, it's yours. You got to handle it. This is out of my control. Um, so, um, so blessings all over the place. God can take care of us. Putting God at the forefront of everything that we do. God will take care of it. What's going on, boys? Sit still. Okay, why are, why are you guys not down here? Mom told you to sit there? Okay, then you sit still. Okay. Brother Kevin. I'm glad I don't have to sit still. <laughs> okay, uh, please turn your hymnals to number 236. Number 236. No, not one. We'll do the first, second, and fourth and fifth verse. a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. like him is so high and holy no not one no not one and yet no friend is so meek and lowly no not one no not one jesus knows all about our struggles he will guide till the day is done there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Did ever saint find this friend forsake him? No, not one. No, not one. Or sinner find that his would not take him? No, not one. No, not one. Amen. Jesus knows all about struggles he will guide till the day is done there's not a friend like the lowly jesus no not one no not one was there a gift like the savior given no not one no not one will he refuse us a home in heaven no, not one, no, not one. Jesus. 
Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Amen. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. Uh, Genesis 35. Genesis chapter 35. Luke, that's the first book of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, act like you're not. I'm not going to laugh at your joke, Dad. Exodus 35. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Here I am. It's in the front of my Bible. I'm here dissing on my son, and I'm like, oh, where am I going? 34, 35, uh, Genesis 35, verse 1 through 7, verse 1 through 7. The Bible says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel, and dwell there, and there make an altar unto God uh, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said uh, to, unto his household and all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and he, uh, was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand, and uh, all the earrings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak uh, that was by Shechem, um, uh, and journeyed, uh, and they journeyed, verse number five, and they journeyed, uh, and the uh, terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, uh, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, uh, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, uh, or some folks would say El Bethel, uh, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now all this is a story. You go, okay, what's the significance here? What's going on? All right, God told Jacob, Jacob, arise and go. Uh, get out of here. Go to Bethel and uh, uh, build an altar there. Now, um, there's a historical background that I gave you last week about Jacob. We did a little dive. We went back to Genesis chapter 28. Now, you remember in Genesis 28, um, oh, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but 30 years before, Jacob had made a vow to God. 30 years before this, Jacob made a vow to God. It was made as he was running away from Esau, Scripture tells us, that he had stolen uh, Esau's blessing from his father, Isaac, um, you know, the blessing of the oldest boy. Uh, and then uh, he's leaving Beersheba. He headed toward Haran. Uh, uh, and on the way to Haran during this 30 years before, he stopped at his what is now called Bethel, Bethel in Genesis chapter 28. During, or during this chapter, Genesis 28, Jacob had a dream, right? Jacob had this really, it's actually a famous dream, uh, that a lot of people, even religious folks in every denomination would know about. Um, what he saw is what's commonly known as Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder. Now, Jacob's ladder, uh, angels ascending and descending on a ladder between heaven and earth. Uh, now, in this dream, God promises to be with him and safely return him to his home. So, Jacob, what, hap what, what Jacob did is said, okay, God, if you'll go with me, Genesis 28, verse uh, 10 through 15, Jacob says, all right, God, if you'll keep me safe, if you'll deliver me, if you'll go with me, I'll make you my God, um, and, um, uh, and I'll be your man. You know, I won't, I won't uh, uh, serve any other gods. So this dream, after J Jacob had this dream and a vision of, ladders, uh, of angels going up and down these ladders, he, he got the promise from God that God was going to take care of him, and he made a promise to God to make God his God if he carries out his promise to um, uh, sanctify this place, he said, I'm going to take this stone, which I had for my head, the Bible says, and he talks about it, and he uses the, the stones that he used as his pillow, and he set them up, kind of like stacked them on top of each other, and made a, like a little altar, and then he sanctified it, poured oil on it, sanctified the place, and said, this is a special place, and we, I'm going to call it Bethel. Bethel. Now, God, if you protect me, if you protect me, You'll be my God, and then I'll give you, Jacob said, I give you a tenth of all that you give me. God, I will tithe to you. 
God, if you make me wealthy, God, if you take care of me, God, if you do these things, I will tithe to you. So for the next 20 years after this promise, Jacob dwelt in, in Haran. Um, now, as God promised, he was with Jacob. He kept Jacob safe. Uh, many stories in, these, in these, uh, 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 these, uh, these 30 years. God promised, as God promised, he was with Jacob. And what happened with Jacob? Jacob began to grow. Jacob began to prosper um, with his family, with his wives and his children and his midwives or his um, uh, uh, extra wives on the side, you know, uh, his concubines, if you will. Jacob prospered both in family and oh, not only in family, but in wealth, in wealth. Um, God took care of him. God took care of him. You find in Genesis 29 and Genesis 30, the chapters, how God began to prosper Jacob. Jacob was born a deceiver, lied, lied to his father uh, in cahoots with his mother. Um, I think they just knew that Esau was going to waste it away. Was going, uh, maybe they looked at Esau and said, he's a harsh guy. He's, um, he's more of a, um, he doesn't have the mind or for administration and to be able to carry on the, 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 the family tradition. You know, who knows what will happen if Esau gets the blessing. So Jacob, uh, with his mother, uh, uh, tricked Isaac and, and received the blessing because Isaac was going blind and, and he, he couldn't really tell the difference. And what happened was is God protected him from Esau killing him. So uh, God promised Jacob and Jacob promised God and they kind of went along for the next 20 years. Jacob dwelt in Haran and um, uh, uh, what happened was is Jacob returned God kept him safe. Now, I've called this uh, forgotten vows or forgotten promises because what we read in Genesis 35 is these 30 years later that Jacob is dwelling in Haran when he promised, hey, God, I, you make me my God. I'll make you my God, and I'll return to this place one day, Lord. I will, I will come back to this place of blessing. I'll come back to my home. I'll do it. And Jacob, for the next 30 years, had forgotten his promise to God. He got comfortable. Now, as God promised Jacob, he was with Jacob, and Jacob prospered in his family, getting wealth. And when Jacob returned, God kept him safe. Kept him safe from what? Laban, his, his uh, father-in-law. Laban was looking for him because Laban is the defrauder, and Jacob had to defraud Laban to justify the situation. You see, there's a, something they say that two wrongs don't make a right. If you read the thing about Jacob, what Jacob did, Jacob didn't defraud Laban at all. He had to make things right because Laban defrauded him and was using him. And Jacob said, all right, in the middle of the night, we're loading up and getting out of here. And they split. Jacob gathered all that was his, which was more than what Laban had. But since Jacob was with Laban, he said, this is pretty much all mine too. And Jacob said, nope, we're loading up and getting out of here. And he split. And Laban held a grudge all these years trying to find Jacob. But God kept Laban uh, uh, away from finding Jacob. So not only Laban, but also from, from Esau. Also from Esau. Esau was looking for him to, to kill him. <laughs> Esau had 400 guys with swords with him. Esau was a guy that was um, looking for a fight. He was a bloody man. He was a guy who was all about, hey, violence, I'm for it. Not only, not only am I not diplomatic, I'm anti-diplomatic, and I'm looking for a fight. That was Esau. And Jacob knew, man, that's my big brother. He's a great ally, but I do not want him as an enemy. I'm staying away from him. God, you have to protect me. And God protected him. God kept him safe. Now, God kept up his end of the bargain. So by the time of our text, Genesis 35, Jacob had been living in Canaan for 10 years. So he settled near the city of, um, some folks would say it's Shechem because of, because of its culture, where it comes from. There's a K in there. Uh, uh, but um, uh, Shechem, as, a, as an English guy, uh, but Shechem, or Shechem, however you'd like to pronounce it, that, that doesn't matter really. He dwelt in the city that wasn't the promised place. That's the point of this. Uh, Genesis 33, 18 uh, tells us where he was dwelling, but he had not bothered, he hadn't remembered to go back to Bethel where the Lord had appeared to him and where he made his vow. 
Now, I got into some things last week about, man, we get into these, we, we, we get into situations of life where we have to promise God something, and then we kind of get out of it, it abates, the storm calms, and we kind of go, okay, well, I'm, I'll do my vow later. I'll get with it later. You see, Jacob had gotten comfortable. Jacob had, he was settled. I made a vow to God, and God kept his part. But God came along one day in the future and said, okay, it's time for you to hold up to your, your end of the bargain. See, that's why all these, and I, and I mentioned all these folks I went to youth conference with, and not just me and our church, but churches all around the country. We'd go to camps, we'd go to youth conferences, and all these young men would stand up and say, I'm called to preach. Okay, if that was a bona fide vow, a promise, they went up to the altar and made promises to God, God will claim that promise. You, can't, you cannot promise God things and then just forget about them and go about your way and, not, and God not remember. It may take 30 years, but God will, God is just. Yes, God is love, but God is just. And God will say, you made a promise, you hold up to it. You see, I believe that God takes promises and vows very, very seriously. On the simple verse of, I will magnify my word above my name. When God gives his word, it's done. And as a child of God, we're supposed to emulate, emulate the children and the son of God, which the attributes of God, and God wants us to hold, God, I believe God is holding us to the same example when it comes to vows. If you give your word, you've given your name. You've given your name, you've given your word, you've given, that's who you are, the essence of who you are. You've given that as a vow, whole, see it through. And Jacob had forgotten. Jacob had gotten so far into comfort and forgetting the vow that he allowed pagans in his house, pagan gods in his house. Whew. Now, um, here's the application. Last week I gave you, first God expects us to keep the vows we make. God expects us to keep the vows we make. Don't say something you don't mean. Don't say something you don't plan on seeing through. Uh, God expects us to keep the vows we make. Number two I gave you, uh, we are prone to forget our vows when God has done his part. Hey, he did his part. Now I'm just kind of, I'll do my part later. God did his part and it was sufficient enough to get me through. We're prone to forget our vows when God has done his part. Uh, we see where God fulfilled his side, but Jacob had forgetfulness. Jacob had forgotten, uh, or so it seems. Maybe Jacob kept it in his heart all that time. We don't know. But Jacob forgot. Uh, some people say um, uh, we have that mentality, that foxhole promise mentality. Well, we're in the foxhole and bullets are flying over our head and mortars are coming and raining in. And we're in that foxhole and we're like, oh God, if you'll get me out of this. And then God gets us out of that. And then we don't hold up our bargain. How many, how many GI Joes, amen? How many army men? How many Marines? How many um, uh, sailors made promises to God in times of distress? Saw it through, was able to live through the terror and then didn't become, didn't repent, didn't. You see, folks, God didn't forget that. You see, oh, I don't have my coins with me. I meant to have, we treat promises of God like pennies at a wishing well. Flip. Oh, dear God, I promise. Oh, dear God, I promise. That, that penny hit the well. Those promises hit the ears of God. He didn't forget he didn't forget. Now, I did caution you last week. Don't make promises. Don't make promises in, when you are in serious emotional states because you're probably not thinking straight. If you don't have the ability to calm yourself down and go, okay, let me think about this situation. God, I promise you, if you'll deliver me, if you'll see me through, I give my life to you, Louis Zamperini or somebody. God, I'll be a preacher. God, I'll be a missionary. God, I'll be a teacher. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, but what happens is, is God gets us through, and we're like, whew, okay. I'll catch you later, Lord. I'll get with you later. 
Number one, God expects us to keep the vows we make. Number two, God expects, uh, 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 we're prone to forget when God keeps his end of the bargain. Number three, we're prone to forget our vows when things are going well. Hey, man, life is good. Life is good for me. I got a good job. My marriage is steady. The kids are finally doing, they're settling. Life is good. I got my granite countertops or quartz or whatever, butcher block, whatever you like. I've got my, my, uh, my, the, my, my uh, designer kitchen. You know, I got my, my hair's done perfect. I found the right barber or the right beautician or whatever. Uh, uh, life is good. My health is good and my wealth is good. You know, I, of course, we always want to be richer. We always want to be a little slimmer, a little fitter, a little whatever. But overall, life is good. Yeah, did you remember when you were 15 and you walked the aisle at that camp meeting and told the Lord, Lord, I don't feel like, maybe you came from a broken home. Maybe you were just a bus kid. Maybe you were the pastor's kid. And you walked forward at that youth conference or that, that uh, a church meeting, that revival meeting, that tent meeting. And you said, dear God, I promise if you'll help me in life, if you'll protect me, if you'll get me through this, God, I'll give my life to you. God, I will raise my children for you. It's not up for me to say what you did or didn't do, but the Lord knows. The Lord knows what you promised when you fell on your knees and you raised your hands to the air and you said, oh God, I promise I don't know if there's a record book in heaven of our promises and how many of them were filled out, how many of them had a check mark next to them saying, promise made, promise kept. Do you remember um, H- uh, Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, who said, Lord, if you will bless me with a child, to be, because to be barren in those days was a curse. To be a woman in that culture and to be able to bear your husband a son and to be the vessel of carrying on a family name was a very high um, um, achievement, if you will. And Hannah did not have children. And uh, the second wife in the culture, her name was Penina, Penina, uh, Panera Bread, maybe. Uh, uh, Her name was Penina, and she had children, and she mocked Hannah, and she, she peacocked, you know around Hannah all the time. And Hannah went to the temple and said, oh dear God. And Eli thought she was drunk. Eli's a big old fat man is what he was. <laughs> and he said, Hannah, what are you doing? Get, what are you drinking? Or what, you're gonna come to the house of the temple drunk. And she said, I'm not drunk. I am distraught. I need a child. And she said, dear God, if you'll give me a child, if you bless me with a child, I'll give that child to you. Now think about that, mothers. God opened her womb. She was able to have a child, Samuel. And she bore that little boy and um, nursed that little boy and weaned that little boy and taught him his ABCs and one, two, threes. He was able to walk. I think, his, I think she was able to spend a few years with him, but still a little boy. And she took him to the temple and said, Lord, he's yours. Preacher, he's yours. Raise him for the Lord. And every year she brought him a new coat. But she made a promise and she kept it. That's a hard promise, to give up your kid. But folks, if there's anything, if there's any, there's any thing that you're gonna give your kid up for, give him up for the Lord. Give him up for the Lord. And we live in a time where, folks, don't bring me your kids. I'm not raising them. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but to be able to raise your kid for the Lord, to be able to say, Lord, these are your kids. No, I think a, a few times we've had a baby dedication. I remember that there, there was a couple that came up here. They're now divorced. Their life is a, a joke of sorts. And they had this little baby and they dedicated that little baby girl to the Lord. That little baby girl's not being raised for the Lord. But it could, t- it could be 30 years. 30 years 
and God's working on the heart and the spirit of somebody. Promises made to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord will reckon them. So, but what happens is we get comfortable. Look at Jacob here. Jacob, oh man, he's Bethel and God told him to go there and Jacob and all his household and he said, man, get rid of all the gods and put them all away. Here he is living on, living on his, his name and his character. I'm healthy, I'm wealthy. Look at all my wives, look at all my kids, look at all my servants, look at all my stuff. He was comfortable. Life was easy. He had forgotten his vow. We're prone to forget our vows. We're prone to forget our vows when things are going well. Fourth, I gave you, uh, or this is, this is fresh. We're prone to forget our vows when we've allowed ourselves to be influenced by the world. When we allow ourselves to be influenced by the world. There was a man who, who, who so many, and there are so many that come to my mind, say, uh, the Lord's called me to the mission field. The Lord's called me to the mission field. And while you're preparing to go to the mission field, you get involved with professionals in a certain career field, and that career field opens and you become very successful at it. You begin to make a lot of money at it. Uh, you're, a, you're a smooth talker. You can um, persuade people. You can get people to sign on, so to speak. You can get people to buy the product, and you become very successful in your field. And you begin to hang around with the peers that are in that field. And maybe um, uh, people who are your senior in that field who know things about that career that you don't know. And you aspire, you look at what, you look at the planes they fly in. You look at the clothes that they wear and the cars they drive and the homes that they live in. And the, um, the social alcohol that they drink. And the celebratory cigar that they smoke. And you go, wow, what a cool lifestyle. And by the way, it is appealing. It absolutely is. The world is not just dun dungeons and chains and demons and darkness and thorns. That's down the road. The path is smooth. The beginning path is whiskey. It's smooth. No, whiskey is not smooth. By the way, if you see commercials that say tequila is smooth, it's not smooth. It's not smooth. You'll drink, and then you go. <laughs> Woo, that was good. What? It's like getting a hammer and going, pow. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Goodness gracious. Next. Pow. It's not smooth. It's not good. It starts out that way. But it's not. It's fun at the beginning, but the end thereof is destruction. The end thereof is death. And what happens is, is it starts off smooth. The career is great. Man, you're surrounded by beautiful people. People who invest in their bodies and cosmetics and they're all fit and they, they, they're intellectual. But what about the mission field? You see, I'm not against a career if the career is on the path that leads you to the mission. You see, the career's got to be a stepping stone to get into the promise. I'm not, a, I'm not against wealth, of course. But you've got to be able to say, I'll leave it all behind. I'm going to enjoy this stepping stone while I have it. But folks, there are very few and very far in between who can keep their eyes on the prize and not be influenced by the world. The, folks, the world is, is um, more effective than we, than we possibly give it credit for. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, Jacob's family, if you look at that verse, Jacob's family, verse number two, Jacob's family, what they did is they accepted foreign gods. It says it. And Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him, put away the strange gods, Okay, hold on a second. Er, call the phone. If, that, if he said, put away the strange gods, there must be a known God. There must be a familiar God. 
Well, folks, if we have a known God and a familiar God, what in the world do we have strange gods for? Put them away. Paul said they're not real gods anyway. They're sticks and stones and dirt and clay. Those things can't hear you. Molech can't hear you. It's not real. It's a made-up thing that the devil has said, hey, make this imaginary God, this image, be a god. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, and, 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 and um, the, uh, uh, the Romans, the Greeks, everybody has had these, these, these gods, whether in fleshly form or made out of things that God spoke into existence, like trees and water and the sun and the stars. The sun god. Yeah, okay. All the sun god ever did for you was sunburn. It's the god of gods. Now, what happened was is, is Jacob's house was influenced by the world. Influenced by the world. His wives, they, she, uh, uh, what are these shows? Um, Housewives of New Jersey or whatever. Housewives of Atlanta. Now, I've never watched that stuff, not one second of it. Uh, there's more plastic in their faces than Walmart has on its shelves in the toy aisle. Uh, uh, I don't watch that stuff, but uh, Housewives of Haran. Christians ought not be mixed up in that. But Jacob's wives were mixed up in the gossip and the trend and where they got their pedicures and manicures and where they got their eyebrows, you know, laced or whatever and where they had their hair did and where they, where they got all these things and they, they were a part of it. And they said, oh, that's what, that's what um, uh, Rachel does. You know, that's what Susan does. And what happened was is the world like a tidal wave, washes over you, it comes into your home, and then it doesn't stay. or And then it stays. And that's what happened with Jacob. Jacob had the world living in his home. We're influenced by the world. So in similar fashion, just like Jacob, a lot of people, we don't live up to the vow they made when we became um, partners with God. You see, a lot, of, a lot of Christians do that, even when they get saved. You know, I've seen that. Um, they get saved, they get on fire, they're zealous. But what happens if they don't change their crowd and their peers? Uh, what good, what good is a fire that's gone cold? What good's a fire that's flaming, burning, and then it goes away? Man, we've had fires that burnt for days before. Days. Why? Because we kept wood on the fire because we kept fuel in it. And see, the best way to lose your zeal, the best way to lose your passion, and the best way to forget your vow is to get around people who, who don't have vows and goals to God. We start listening to popular music. We start feeding ourselves with that. Humanistic teaching in our schools. Uh, what happens to our kids? What happens, man, I, talking to Brother Storm and, and Dr. Pohazi and, and others about, man, we've got to get the primary kids. And then we've got to have a stellar Sunday school and, and primary lesson. And we've got it. We have to. We have to have one of the most prayerful, hardworking Sunday school departments in all the world if we're going to reach children of Fort Wayne because the drag queens are starting to get them because the homosexuals are starting to get them, because humanistic and pagan teaching is starting to get them. Where they say, I don't know what I am. You don't know what you are because you've been told you don't know what you are. Boys and girls are going to school and their teachers are subliminally teaching them. You don't know what you are. Lucas says, I'm, I'm a boy. Well, you think you're a boy. No, I'm, I'm a boy. Well, you think you're a boy because that's a construct. It's not a construct. X, Y, and X, X. There's no difference. When you die and you turn into bones, they're going to look at your pelvic bone and go, that was a boy or that was a girl. That's it. There is no, well, this was a, there are, uh, th by the way, when the left-leaning people start saying things that are conservative, you know that things are getting bad. Piers Morgan had some interview with some guy. Piers Morgan is an is a, is a, um, uh, English fella, anti-gun, anti-America, basically, even though he enjoys the freedoms that we have. 
he had some interview with some guy and uh, the guy was trying to explain that it was a guy. I, th I think it was. A guy was explaining non-binary and all these things. And Piers Morgan had a list of all the different genders there were over 100. He said a, a gender of a two-spirited person. Folks, we're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. We are going cuckoo in here. It's not lighthearted. It's sin. And it is being amplified. It's being amplified. And we cannot let the world into our thinking. No. I'm in, well, you're just not accepting. Well, wait a second. Aren't you not accepting of what I believe? If I believe in, in, in one, God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and you're over there believing, you know, you're a two-spirited person and you're non-binary and you're whatever you are and you want me to respect what you believe but you don't want to respect what I believe. You see, that's a two-way street. Here's how Jake Jackson feels about it. You go on with yourself. You think what you want and do what you want but number one, you don't get to force that on everybody else. The, um, I think it's, the, the uh, it may be, I quoted off a movie or something, but the needs of the few do not outweigh the needs of the many. When in the world do minorities get to run the show? Folks, and that's where we get into a problem. Where we think the majority, um, the majority goes on and forgets the minority. No, 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 folks, we're spo it's supposed to be unified. It's supposed to be unified. But when in the world do, the, do minority groups get to come in and say, hey, majority, this is, what you, you, this is what you get to do. This is what you get to say. This is how you get to... It'd be like, be like Hudson telling me and, me and Jamie as parents what we're doing, how we're going to do things, where we're going to go, what we're going to have for dinner, what time we're going to wake up. Nah, I don't think so. I don't think so. And what happened here is these minority gods got into Jacob's house and started running the show. These minority gods got into Jacob's house and said, these are the things that you'll offer. These are the times that you'll pray. This is the way that you will behave. See, strange gods will get you to act strange. They'll get you to do weird things. And we're living in a day and an age where there are the humanistic side of, of, of man is strange Weird, man. I'm telling you, it's a circus. I watch these debates. I see things like this. And people, I feel bad for them. I'm angry at them because of their agenda. These um, don't fear and, and, and drag queen stuff. It's these kids that we got to watch out for. And we're letting the world in. And the Jacob's wives and Jacob's concubines and Jacob's servants and Jacob's children were being uh, um, uh, influenced by these humanistic teachings. A lot of um, adult Christians were influenced by materialism and immorality of our society. But again, that's not an excuse. It's not an excuse to forget our vows. It's not an excuse. We let the world in. Number, uh, number five, number five. We've forgotten our vows. Um, uh, if we've forgotten our vow vows, we need to go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Now you notice it says go back to Bethel. Go back to Bethel. You know, I think there's something sentimental. I come up here many times. This is where I was saved. This is where I proposed to my wife. It's a special place to me. I come up here and, and I pray sometimes. It's a special place. I go back to where I made a decision. I go back to where I made a vow. I go back, and if you can't get there physically, go here mentally. Go back there emotionally. Go back to the beginning. Jacob was to, told to go back to Bethel. In just a similar way, Jesus told the church at Ephesus, go back to the beginning in Revelations 2. Go back to your first love. Go back to the things that made you who you were. Go back to those things. They had left their first love, and they were told by Jesus to remember, remember from where you've fallen. Go back in your life and go, man, where did I start tripping up? Where did I start falling? Where did I start forgetting? Why am I not the way I used to be in a, um, with a critical eye, an, ex an eye of examination, look at yourself and go, am I better or am I worse? If I'm worse, how did I get here? 
And if I am in Canaan, if I am in Haran, where is my Bethel? And I need to get back there. The, Jesus told them, repent and do, thy first, do the first works. Now, for Christians who've left their first love, they need to do their first works. You say, what are your first works? Very easy. The fundamentals of Christianity. Read your Bible, pray, three to thrive. Read your Bible, oh, here's an idea, religiously. <laughs> pray religiously. Go to church religiously. For all the time, doors are open, be there. Make a decision. Doors are open, I'm going to be there because I need fed. The preacher may have something for me. Somebody may have something for me that I need. Do thy first works, the fundamentals. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? To get back to your Bethel. Why? To keep your promises of God so you can be a man of your word or a woman of your word and God can bless you. If we've forgotten our vows, go back to the beginning. And then lastly, lastly, when we fulfill our forgotten vows, when we fulfill them, here we are living our life, do to do yippee doo da dippy dee day My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. And then you go, oh, man, I, I made a promise to God. And God tells you, hey, go back to Bethel. Go back to the place where you promised. And you do that and you go, okay, I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm going back to my blessings or I'm going back to my vows. And when we begin to fulfill our forgotten vows, there are renewed blessings. You see, when we make a vow to God, God, I believe, has all these blessings lined up, all these provisions lined up. And when we forget them, what we're doing is we're putting them on hold. We're putting them on hold, going, oh, I don't want those blessings. I'm gonna go do my thing. I'm gonna see how it works out for me. But when we go, oh, man, God, forgive me. I'm going to fulfill my vows. I'm going to get right. I'm going to do what's right. The windows of blessing, the wheels of blessings, God's blessing factory for you begin to turn again. And you get renewed blessings. Somebody said something to me the other day along the lines of somebody basically just um, not being right with God. And I said, listen, all they're doing is, del is delaying God's blessings. You can't be obedient and not get blessed. You can't be a, 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 a son, a daughter, a workman, a steward, a soldier, an ambassador, and try to live right and do right and be separate. You can't do right and not get blessed. Just like you can't sin and get by, you can't do right and not get blessed. You can't keep your vows to God and God not provide for you and bless you. So when Jacob fulfilled his vow, he went back. The Bible says God appeared to him and renewed the promises that had been made to Abraham and to Isaac. You see, Jacob was holding up God's working and God's promise for Abraham and Isaac because Jacob had forgotten his vows. God made a promise to Isaac, I'll be with you and your children's children. Abraham, you're going to have children like the sand of the sea and like the stars of the sky. They'll be everywhere. They'll be countless. They'll all be yours. Jacob held it up. All the victories that, uh, that this nation, that this Abraham, this uh, a nation of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were all supposed to, I mean, no telling what could have happened in the 30 years that Jacob had forgotten his vow. So um, if you read, uh, I'm not going to do it because um, we're going to get out of here. But Genesis 35, verse 9 through 15, you know, it's not that long. I'm going to read it. The Bible says, And God appeared unto Jacob again, and he came uh, out of uh, uh, Paddan Aram, and blessed him. This is verse 9. And God said unto him, Jacob, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, uh, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. You see, God didn't say this to Jacob when he was in Canaan. He didn't say it to him when he was Haran. He had to come back to the place of the vow. He had to come to the place of realization that I made a promise to God. God, I'm getting right with you tonight. And God said, cool, since you're getting right with me, Here's the renewed blessing. 
Kings are going to come out of you. Wealth is coming to you. Children are coming to you. A great nation is coming to you. And he said in verse 11, uh, verse 12, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee will I give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Jacob had inherited property. He couldn't claim the property until he got right with God. See, there's, there's property, there's wealth, there's prosperity and success out there for the Christian who keeps their vows to God. In verse 13, and God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake to him, Bethel, Bethel. You know, and so it can be with us. If we have uh, maybe forgotten an original commitment, God, I'm going to be there no matter what on Wednesdays. I don't care how tired I am. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to be there. Some people, they say, Brother Jake, I'm, I'm going to drive the bus. Are you gonna, and I ask, are you going to drive it when it's cold? Are you going to drive it when it's hot? Are you going to drive it when the kids are good? Are you going to drive it when they're bad? Are, are, I'm going to be a Sunday school teacher. Cool. Can I count on you? Right, can God count on you? I'm going to be an usher. Awesome. Will you be kind to everyone who walks through those doors? Will you open the door? Will you do a good job? Will you do the right thing? If you make a commitment, you better, make, you better keep to it. God says, make a promise and keep it. Is that, is that with us? Maybe we've forgotten, we've forgotten a commitment. When we first obeyed the gospel of Christ, we got saved. But folks, if we'll just return to our Savior, return to fellowship with him, um, ask God like David did. Say, God, search my heart. Is there something between you and me? Is there something? If we will, here's that word that scares everybody, repent from our forgetfulness and our um, procrastination, of our vows toward God. And what we need to do is fulfill our vows of service, fulfill our devotion to him, recommit to him, and all what's gonna happen, <laughs> all the spiritual blessings that he has for us are ours again. So if you're a Christian, you're born again, but you're not living for the Lord, then you're missing out. You're missing out. If you're not living a dedicated and committed life to God, that God expects, you're missing out. And if so, then like Jacob, you've forgotten your vow. I, you know, I might have forgotten things before. I've been in dire situations before, and I'm like, dear God, if you'll deliver me. But I live in such a way that if I have forgotten a vow, I'm pretty close to being in the place that remembers it. I read my Bible, I pray, I talk to the Lord, I'm in the house of God, I do what's right as, mu as much as I can. I want God to help me remember my vows so I can keep them. So if you, like Jacob, have forgotten your vow, you need to come back to the Lord in full repentance like Jacob did, and what's gonna happen? The blessings of heaven await you if you do. Now listen, I, smaller crowd tonight, I think there's pretty solid good people in here, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if you've made promises to God 10 years ago that you haven't kept. Go back in your mind right now and think of times of turmoil and think of times of distress and think of times where it was easy and go, man, did I ever make God any promises and I haven't delivered on them? If that's the case, we need to get it right. Now, this is all kinds of people watch these videos. It's really neat. I'm able to kind of monitor uh, a little bit and see how many people like our page. And um, it gives um, uh, not necessarily analytics, but statistics. Um, we have 51% of people that like our page are men. 49% of people that like our page are women. The age brackets is mainly um, uh, ba basic 25 to 40. 52, I think, is where our most, most ages are. Um, we have people all over the world that like our page, some from countries that I didn't even know were countries, um, uh, all over the place. And so I don't, the Internet's a great thing because these things reach, they reach everywhere. If you've made a promise to God, then keep it. But if you're not a Christian, 
the first thing you need to do is get saved. You know, I missed out this morning. I need to end every single sermon with the gospel. Every single one. You say, well, everybody already here is saved. It may not be for you. It may be for somebody on there. And it's good practice for me. We had people come to this church for a decade and then one invitation raise their hand and go, I don't know that I'm saved. I need to nail it down. I was, me, at the age of 13, I think, getting ready to be 14. But uh, 13 years old, February 1st, 2001, 13. Uh, I raised my hand. I said, I need to make sure. So I can't just assume you're saved. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but if you're not saved, you need to get saved. And the way that you get saved is you ask Jesus to save you. Realize that you're a sinner. Know that you understand that. Accept it. Admit it. You're a sinner. And since you're a sinner, you have to die and go to a place called hell to pay for your sins. You've got to pay the debt. But God, in his justness and his mercy, said, man, I didn't create hell for people. I created it for the devil and his, and his henchmen. I created it for the demons of hell. That's, that's who I created it for. But man has become like Satan because man has sinned. So therefore, I created hell for sin, and mankind has sinned. So therefore, they have just qualified themselves for hell. I need to make a way to save mankind. So God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You call on the name of Jesus Christ and say, dear Jesus, if you'll save me the way I am, I'll take you. Dear God, please forgive me of my lostness. Forgive me of my sin. You say, what sin? The sin of not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you get saved, you're not saying, dear God, forgive me of my drunkenness. Forgive me of my drug use. You're saying, forgive me for not yielding and believing in Jesus Christ. See, that's what, it, all. you know what all God's looking for? God's just looking for a people, a people, a drunk, a, a pimp, a prostitute, a preacher, and a parent. God's just looking for people who say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Even in my condition, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Almighty. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I am asking him to save me and not let me go to hell. Oh, God, would you save me? Please save me. I can't change my ways on my own. I don't have the power to do it. Dear God, I don't want to go to hell. Would you save me? God's not going to go, well, clean up your life first. Get qualified first. Then I guess the thief on the cross went and died and went to hell. So, folks, it's so simple yet so profound. Works, works, works. No, thief on the cross. Dude was, a, dude was a Jew. If he had to be saved by works, he, was, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today. So anybody that comes around speaking this and preaching this work salvation garbage, they're apostates. They're heretics. It's the faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I don't care what anybody says about it. Listen, I've listened to um, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro. Uh, ben Shapiro is a Jew, kind of debate this subject. And Jordan Peterson, he's very, very um, intellectual, but he he's trying to intellectually smooth with Ben Shapiro. The fact is, Mr. Shapiro, it doesn't matter what you think justice is. Uh, uh, he thinks, his thing is like, hold on a second, you're telling me that you just believe on Jesus Christ and that's your free ticket to heaven and you can kind of go off and live the way you want? Man, such a deep subject. But the fact of the matter is, Lord, would you remember me when we come into paradise? What else can you say? What else is there to say? So yes, Mr. Shapiro, anybody, anybody, Ben Shapiro's not gonna see this, but anybody from the lowest to the highest, from the lightest to the darkest, anybody who says, Jesus, will you save me? Oh God, save me. Jesus will come in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if you have believed on Christ, change. Get in church. Do what's right. We did it in Sunday school this morning. I think the best discipleship program 
is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. That's the best discipleship program. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. You just took your faith and put it in Christ. The best way to show that you're saved is adding to your faith. That, I believe that's the best discipleship program. Go out and find them, write down their addresses, and go hawk them, folks. You gonna come to church with me this week? You gonna come to church with me this week? You gonna come to church with me this week? Finally, they'll come. I talked to Brother Bob Gray. Brother Bob Gray said, I just am relentless. You are going to come to church. I'll be here tomorrow at 9.15 to pick you up. You are going to walk the aisle. You are getting baptized. <laughs> Brother Gray was relentless. I'm like, how did you do that? He was like, eh, strong arm. I'm like, yeah, that's not my style, you know. <laughs> strong arm Christianity, you know. Uh, not, not quite, you know. Uh, but Brother Bob Gray, spirit-filled and got power and able to influence people to make the right decision. That's what we're trying to do is lead people to make the right decision. Um, but uh, uh, these, these vows, if you've made a promise to God, God made a promise to you. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. I won't forget you. I'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, your promise, your promise, make a promise to God and say, God, I'm going to try to live for you. I'm going to try to do what's right. I don't care if it takes 30 years to get there. I'm going to try to do what's right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the promises of the Bible that you've given us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're getting ready to go back out this week. It's Monday tomorrow. There's errands and jobs and all kinds of uh, responsibilities and obligations and work and travel and things to take care of. Um, the world, Lord, not just the allurements and the amusements of the world, but the burden of the world can also get us to forget our promises because we get so busy trying to make some headway in this life, to find a place of comfort, to build ourselves a little nest when the teachings of Jesus were very, very, um, very simple. Not to put so much stock in this world. Not to build our, our lives to be so comfortable and so cushy that we don't need God. And not only do we not need God, but, you know, I want to backtrack on the promises I made when I was a kid at youth conference or camp. Heavenly Father, what a great thing it would be for all those thousands of young boys and and, and, and young girls who made decisions years ago and who will make decisions this year will hold true to those promises and say, God, you called me a mission, mission field. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue it with all my heart. Everything I do is a stepping stone to the mission field or to be a pastor or to be a teacher or to be a, a, a godly parent. Everything we do is calculated, Heavenly Father. Oh, what a great thing that would be. A revival in the hearts of people who have made promises. And then, Lord, the blessings that lie on the other side. Oh, Father, forgive us that we, we resist your blessings. That we, 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 we put a hold, a stop. We close the windows of heaven and not receive things from you because we're not faithful. Lord, forgive us. Remember our frame. Be patient with us. But Lord, above all, I'd ask that you'd let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Help us not to quench him and to grieve him. Lord, if there's anybody in this room tonight who the Holy Spirit isn't speaking to anymore, simply because we don't listen, simply because we're not trying to listen, or we just constantly disobey him, Lord, forgive us. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to do what's right. Keep us safe this week. Bring us all back. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss Jennifer.